Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final presentation of the 2023 Holocaust and Genocide Lecture Series. Before we begin our presentations for this evening, I am pleased to announce the winner of the Hans Angres Award. This year, the award is given to Jennifer D. Kawan. Jennifer, I hope you take time to learn about the life of Hans Angres and his dedication to education about genocide and fighting its occurrence. It is an honor to receive an award dedicated to him. We congratulate you and we trust that you will use it for a purpose that Hans would applaud. Our speakers this evening are familiar and highly regarded participants in our lecture series. They each bring you a unique and very important perspective on Rwanda and the genocide of 1994. Her Excellency Mathilde Mukantabana, who is missing in action at the moment, but she will return, is the ambassador of the Republic of Rwanda to the United States. Prior to that appointment, Ambassador Mukantabana was a professor of history at Kasumnas River College in Sacramento from 1994 to 2013. Ambassador Mukantabana has been a passionate community organizer for several decades and was a co-founder of many associations and organizations whose purpose was to promote a positive engagement and collaboration of the Rwandan communities in the United States. She was long a board member of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide and belongs to many local and international organizations, including the International Association of Genocide Scholars and the Organization of African Leaders in Diaspora. Ambassador Mukantabana holds a bachelor's degree in history and geography from the University of Burundi, as well as a master's in social work and a master's in history from California State University, Sacramento. I understand that Cal State Sacramento is about to honor Mathilde with an honorary doctorate of humane letters as of next week, I believe. We are very pleased to welcome with her Simon Mudahogora, a genocide survivor, and the ambassador's son, Dahiro Bazimia, a genocide descendant. Our three speakers will offer you many lenses and much insight on the Rwandan genocide and its aftermath. Welcome one and all, and Mathilde, I'm glad to see you. So now we may go for live on audio and we shall begin. Thank you so much, Diane. Can you hear me? Yes, I certainly can. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Diane, faculty, students, members of the board of, of the Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Sonoma State University, friends, countrymen. Really, again, it's an honor and a privilege to be here at Sonoma because Sonoma has been, uh, as I told you in the past, more than just an institution. But before I begin, really it's with great sadness and a heavy heart that I would like to first of all express my deepest condolences to Barbara and to all of you who are present today for the untimely death of our dear friends, Myrna and Mark. Uh, I can't say much about them today, but they were both incredible friends. They were my mentor, my solid rocks, and for the whole family and the community, uh, especially when we were going through our most difficult uh, periods of genocide, but also of loss in many different ways. Uh, it, it's extremely difficult for me not to see them in the audience for the first time uh, since we started to give this lecture at Sonoma more than a decade ago. Uh, Myrna and Mark, for me, epitomized the best of our lives. They relentlessly fought for a peaceful and just world, and also stri always strive to make the elusive and ever again a reality. So I also have to say they were the first to introduce us to the Sonoma State Holocaust Studies. And since then, Sonoma has held a very special place in our history as Rwandans living in California and beyond. So Diane, your university and what you have been doing, especially through the lecture series, 
have made Sonoma a rallying ground for a devoted community of organizers, educators, in their protracted fight against genocide and genocide ideology. So I'm thankful for the Holocaust and genocide studies at Sonoma for uh, really becoming a forum that has been actively speaking against the hatred, injustice, bigotry, and prejudice, and for its vigilance against any attempt to blur the historical record. So we are three of us in our presentation. We'll begin with Simon Mudahogora, as you indicated. We'll give you, who is going to give a glimpse on the plight of survivors during the 1919, 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Then in Dahiro, we refer with his account of how the second generation was also deeply affected by the genocide. And I finally give remarks on the genocide in a general perspective. Thank you so much. Uh, but more importantly, maybe before we even begin, we, 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 we welcome many insights and questions you have at the end of our presentation. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you, Matilda. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so my name is Simon, uh, for those who uh, don't know me, uh, and I am um, a genocide survivor. So as a 10 years old, when the genocide began, you know, I remember seeing the signs that, that it was about to, to start. But most of us didn't want to see the signs. Uh, so therefore, we ignored it. So at this time, the genocide was happening through parts of the country mostly the northern part of, of Rwanda. And in the south, you know, we were listening to what was happening on the radios, but not once did you ever think that it was going to make it to our area. I also remember our family's friends, you know, stopping by our house uh, in terror. They were scared. Uh, they were fleeing from the capital of Rwanda, which is Kigali, headed to Burundi. At that time, again, the genocide had already begun in the northern parts of Rwanda, but not yet to our area. So that family continued to Burundi, but my family refused to go, so we stayed. During that time, I remember seeing our uh, Hutu neighbors kind of just monitoring our home, you know, walking around in the streets, you know, looking at our house, looking at my parents, uh, almost like they knew something that we didn't. But as always, my parents reassured us that, hey, you know, those are our neighbors, we know everyone, there's no way they will ever kill us. Every day, we will go to school uh, in the South. Again, the, the schools in the North were closed due to genocide, but the, in the South, business was going on as usual. So we were forced to go to school. In school, it was a constant harassment. So all the, all the Tutsi kids were just being harassed by the Hutu kids. Uh, I remember one the, kid, one the Hutu kid telling me that I was going to die soon. I told my teacher and my teacher did nothing. On the way home, all the Tutsi kids could not take the normal route home. Many times we had to go through the farms so we could not be seen. But many times we were seen. We were chased and the rocks were thrown, thrown at us. Before long, people start dying in our area. However, the killing was not yet permitted. So the Tutsis were being killed at nighttime. All the Hutu extremists were so anxious, so they were killing all the Tutsis in the middle of the night. So at night, my family and I, we would go hide in the forest so we couldn't be seen. So the killer, we could hear the killers looking for us. They searched our homes. They took everything we had. But when they couldn't find us, they went in the forest looking for us. We had to be very quiet that the only thing that we could hear is their voices. Soon, my family realized that we need to leave. 
but unfortunately, it was a little too late. On April 6, my family sent my sister and I to the border of Rwanda and Burundi just to see what was happening. The rumor was that anyone who tried to cross the border got killed by the, by the army. The plan was for my sister to go check it out, uh, see what it's like, and then come back home and report to my family. And all the adults, while my sister and I were traveling, all the adults were you know, trying to sell whatever that we had. So we had money once we got to the, to the other side. After traveling all night uh, with my sister, we finally made it to, to the border uh, in the morning. By the time we got there, it was too late. We could see houses being burnt down. We could hear a lot of screaming in the distance. So we had no choice but to find a way to cross the border and go to the refugee camps. Luckily, there was a family at the, at the river and they helped us cross. So we made it to, to the other side and we never had a chance to go back home to tell our family that there's no army at the border. A few days later in the camp uh, of cold and starvation, we learned that our parents have been killed. This was hard. I even considered taking my own life, but knew that my little sister needed me. Day by day, we kept learning about other family members who were also killed. Life in refugee camps was very rough. We did not have any clothes or food to eat. We had one small tent to share. Not enough toilets, so people went to the bathroom outside your tent. All we had to eat twice a day, it was corn starch that was provided by, by the organization. At that time, being as young as I was, and my sister depending on me, I had to grow up fast. So I had to learn how to survive. So I will go to the nearby fields in search of food. Many times I came back empty handed. We lost faith in God because my sister and I, we grew up going to church every Sunday. We were told that God is great. God takes care of his children. Have you learned all that? And right now we didn't have any belief in God because the struggle was just so unbearable. Eventually, we had to accept the fact that we are alone. We had to accept the fact that our parents are dead. I had to learn how to become a man that's strong enough and capable of taking care of my sister at 10 years old. A few years later, a miracle happened. Thanks to FARA, Friends of Rwanda Association, we got introduced to a, a beautiful, amazing American family who ended up adopting us. At this time is usually when I like to introduce my family to you, my new parents to you, but unfortunately I lost them both uh, into 2020. So rest in peace, Al and Liz. One thing they taught us was the importance of family, education, and giving back. I went to uh, college. I graduated from University of Oregon with a bachelor's degree in economics, minor in math and business, and now work for NBC Universal. Also, uh, I'm a married man now, and I have a, a three-year-old uh, daughter who keeps me busy. And I'm giving back by doing talks like this one, educating people and letting people know that genocide did happen. It's on, it's on all of us to make sure that it never happens again. Thank you for allowing me to be here and the opportunity to share my story with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. I get, now we'll move on and listen to Dahiro. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and excuse any echo uh, you may hear. Um, 
I'd like to say good evening from here in Maryland and good late afternoon to you all over there. Uh, my name is Nehiro Bazimia, and I'm an American descendant of the Genocide Against the Tutsi in Rwanda. And I'm also very honored to be here today. I wanna to extend my thanks to Sonoma State University and the Alliance for Genocide and Holocaust Studies for giving us the opportunity to share our insights and perspectives with the community to my mom here, the ambassador, and to my cousin Simon as a survivor, two people I admire so much as personal heroes and examples. As we gather here, I wanna acknowledge um, the challenges that we've all faced as individuals and as a, as a society. I hope you're all safe and well, and I appreciate you for taking the time to join this presentation. I'd also, uh, before I get into it, I'd also wanna, uh, like my mom, extend my love and sense of loss to this community for Myrna and Mac. And they were the greatest of friends and of allies. This community has suffered a great loss and their efforts and their dear memories will always be appreciated and remembered. And um, through my experiences in speaking before this lecture series and working with the organizers as a genocide descendant, it's become clear that Sonoma State is a pioneer in the study of genocide and is committed to the principle of never again. Understanding the conditions that led to atrocities like genocide and taking action to prevent them is crucial. Our stories are not just our own, but they are also a part of our collective identity as a society and as human beings. It is essential to promote awareness and gain perspective to prevent future genocides and denial. Therefore, I'm honored to be part of this dialogue and I thank you, the audience, for being here today. Let's continue to have this conversation to help create a better future for us. As we all know, uh, whether through our own experiences or education, discussing genocide is a deeply significant issue and it requires a lot of respect. I'm grateful to be here today alongside my cousin, Simon, who you've all heard from his firsthand experience. Um, it's invaluable in ensuring historical accuracy, historical accuracy and in amplifying the need for authentic voices when addressing the wider community. As a genocide of those, or as a descendant of those who experienced genocide, my perspective on this topic has been formed piece by piece, and I navigate the delicate balance between survivor and outsider. There's no roadmap for this, no defined role. While genocide has undoubtedly an influenced my life, I cannot speak for the experiences of those on the ground. This complexity only serves to emphasize the importance of our efforts to promote awareness, gain perspective, and prevent all any future genocides. Because unlike my cousin Simon and many members of my family uh, who lost loved ones in the genocide against the Tutsi, I was just a child when it occurred and had little frame of reference for such atrocities. Grew up in Sacramento as an American, my family was the only one I had ever known. Though the genocide gen directly impacted my family and my life, it had been part of my identity for so long that it felt normalized. Lacking true elders and missing family members from cousins to aunts and uncles and family friends, all their lives were brought to a horrific end. So I had no context for a life or identity that did not include the genocide. Being from an immigrant family, striving to thrive in a Western world, I was also as a Tutsi, I was also a black American, also grew up as a millennial and being American, all of those were facets of my identity that informed and came together to create a complex and unique identity. It can be difficult for me to convey the impact of the genocide and how it affects families and societies around the world who've also been similarly affected. But I believe it's vital to share our stories and perspectives in order to promote awareness. In 1994, when the genocide against the Tutsi occurred, I was just an eight-year-old boy in grade school. Before that, uh, my memories are similar to those of countless immigrant families across this country. We were raised speaking both English and our native language, Kenya Rwanda, but we preferred to speak English in public. We enjoyed eating Italian and Chinese cuisine, but we also savored traditional Rwandan dishes like nyumbati, which is cassava, yams, or ibishimbo, which are beans. Our days were filled with learning traditional Rwandan dances and songs, exploring new neighborhoods, riding bikes, and playing video games. At night, after watching football or 
playing soccer, we would listen to bedtime stories called Umugani from Rwandan mythology, which were like uh, the Grimm's fairy tales that I love to read and which sparked, which sparked my passion for sci-fi and fantasy books. In fact, uh, growing up, you know, I never told this story, but one of my favorite books uh, was Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. And now it's in the media because it was one of the first uh, places where you heard about the metaverse. But I found it so impactful because it was the main character was someone who was also struggling with his identity. He is a biracial black and Korean man who is also living in two worlds, the metaverse and the real world. So I saw it as this type of allegory, even though back then um, I didn't see it that way. But now I, I believe all of that, all of that played a part in my appreciating the book. And, you know, the question of where are you from? has always played a significant role in shaping my identity because as both Rwandan and American and raised in these two worlds, it, it's always been a natural part of who I am. So when the genocide against the Tutsi occurred, I was still a child shielded from the brutal realities on the ground, shielded from the realities that family like, cousin, like my cousin Simon faced. But even though I was fortunate enough to escape the worst of it, I couldn't remain untouched by the effects. Despite our sheltered existence, our family social life was dominated by meetings aimed at helping survivors both within and without the country, um, excuse me, outside of the country. We contributed in ways appropriate for our, for our limited capacity as children from participating in fundraising initiatives to offering shelter for months or even years at a time to people I had no idea about, but my parents convinced me were friends or family, um, but that was the common occurrence and it was our real reality. And these traditions have continued to shape our lives to this very day. Through my observations over the years, I came to the realization that community is the greatest response to genocide and inhumanity. What started as a small gathering of families and friends grew over time as more and more people from all over East Africa came to settle in our small community in Northern California. As a Francophone country, uh, refugees and those leaving Rwanda traditionally went to places like Belgium. They went to France or French Canada, yeah, such as Quebec or Montreal. However, our open community welcomed people from all backgrounds. And eventually we became a branch in another chapter in the creation of a Rwandan diaspora that imparted its own powerful voice on the global stage. We received invaluable support from outside people and institutions like Sonoma, which played a key role in leveraging their community to support our cause. It was our greatest allies that made our impact as a diaspora successful in affecting social policy, both abroad and at home. Without the support of scholars and educated minds like yours, who are not Rwandan, who are not Rwandan, but still stood with us on a human level, um, our efforts would not have been possible. The genocide against the Tutsi was a catastrophic event that shattered our community, it left us struggling, trying to come to terms with our identity in profound ways. Politics is no longer an abstract concept that we can safely ignore. It has tangible consequences for us and our loved ones, whether we like it or not. It's up to us, to each of us, to recognize that we can make a difference and that we are all responsible for the well being of our fellow humans. Our words and actions have a profound impact. And this is a challenge we face as outsiders, descendants, and survivors. As I'm now in my mid thirties, I am acutely aware of why the concept of genocide denial is the final stage of genocide, particularly with the rise of social media, because unfortunately, um, bad actors and other forces in the world seek to rewrite history and muddy the waters by using phrases like both sides, or both sides were bad or both sides were killing or that it wasn't really genocide, but just a war where everyone was dying or everyone was just killing each other. These tactics only perpetuate the cycle of violence and prevent outsiders from seeing the truth. It's up to us to stand up to these bad actors and demand accountability for the atrocities that occurred. Unfortunately, um, within this generation, I've noticed that it's people of my generation the millennials and those who came afterwards, the Gen Z, 
who are using their voices to rewrite history and erase the crimes of their parents. So it's been made evident to me that we need more people like me, more people like Simon to speak out against that as the fight never ends, as genocide denial is the final stage of genocide. So we have a profound responsibility to honor the survivors and remember those who lost their lives by actively listening, seeking understanding and taking meaningful action to contribute to a better future. Each of us has the capacity to make a difference and amplify these voices that have endured unspeakable pain. By sharing our stories and making genocide prevention a part of our collective experience, we join the fight against the ideology that perpetuates such atrocities. It's a small but significant contribution that every individual can make. Thank you all for this commitment to this cause and thank you for your time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Hero, you make so many very important points in your remarks about denial. And we'll get back to that, I'm sure, in the question and answer period. But for now, we'll turn this now over to Mathilde. Mathilde, I think you're muted. Sorry again, I thought I was, <laughs> I was on mute, but uh, I, I want to thank again Simon and Indahiro because what they've said are going to, uh, I think, be the foundation for the questions we are going to get. But I'm going to address uh, in general uh, the genocide against the Tutsi and then maybe uh, leave time for questions. As you know, for uh, now we are on the 29th commemoration of genocide against the Tutsi. Each April 7th, the day when persecution against Rwanda Tutsi exploded into full blown genocide. And we, as a nation, we get together as one. So we started the commemorative events in Rwanda and all of, over the globe, including in Washington, DC, and throughout the country here. And for three months, schools, government agency, private sector, civil society, they each engage in a dialogue aimed at gaining greater understanding of the forces that have wreaked such havoc on Rwanda. It can be a difficult time, not least for the hundreds of thousands of survivors for whom the annual commemoration are both necessary, but also deeply rending, heart rending. You've heard what Simon uh, said. The killings began, began on the uh, eve of uh, Easter. Wednesday, April 6, 1994, and lasted three months. And strangely enough, I have to tell you, um, April in Rwanda tradition, it's called Mata. Mata is milk. Usually it's the time of plenty. It's when people, it's a symbol of life and prosperity. But now it has been etched in our collective memory as a month of blood. By the end, more than one million Tutsi were massacred. Between the second week of April and the third week of May, three quarter Tutsi population fell victim to the genocide. We are talking about everybody, the elderly, children, disabled people were killed. There was no safe haven for, for the Tutsi in Rwanda. And the churches became burial grounds. Members of the Security Council refused to acknowledge the Rwanda killing as a genocide, lest they incur legal obligations under the genocide the convention to which they were signatories and the United Nations troops in Rwanda were summarily withdrawn. So Rwandans were left to their destiny. We died, the world was standing by. The horror was unmitigated, but not inexplicable. For the killing was due to less to atavistic enmity than racist mythology, largely nurtured in the colonial period, and abetted by Belgian and later by the French ruling politic. In the words of the president of Rwanda, then Paul Kagame, all these powerful nations regarded one million lives as valueless, as another statistic, and could be dispensed of. In the aftermath of genocide, Rwanda was a failed state. We had more than a million people dead. Two million people who had perpetrated the genocide. We didn't have any government. Institutions had collapsed. There was no functioning police force, no courts, no judges. 
And as, as many people who were predicted, the Rwanda was destined to become a permanent UN protectorate, or more likely a perennial war zone. If you had asked me then whether our country will re emerge as a functioning nation state, I probably would have smiled at the naivety of the question. It didn't seem likely to say the least. Chaos and conflict seemed infinitely more, uh, uh, more probable. And as we started the upward journey of rebuilding Rwanda, we didn't have any roadmap. There was no historical precedent to help guide them in picking up the pieces. No country has endured what we had, nowhere has such industrial scale slaughter taken place over such a short time. Firstly, it began with implicitly acknowledging that it was up to us. You know, it seemed that the world had abandoned us to our, our, our destiny. As the Nobel Peace Prize laureate during that time, Eri Wiesel said in his acceptance speech, a destruction only men can provoke, only men can prevent. We took it as a step further to add, only Rwandans can fix this. This was, uh, I have to say, it's not a rejection of, of help from outside. Many NGOs, many institutions, including the institution we are, we are at now today, foreign government gave us considerable assistance. And nor does it stem from any nationalistic sentiment. It was simply a recognition that a durable solution of peace, security, and prosperity for Rwandans must come from us. That we must recover, expect, uh, we, we could not recover except by our collective endeavors and connections. That this country, this society, this government was ours, our history, and our future. And the collective memory is a prerequisite for understanding where we were coming from and where we're heading. Historical clarity, as President Kagame did, did, said at the time, is the duty of memory that we cannot escape. Behind the words, and never again, there's a story whose truth must be told in full, no matter how uncomfortable and painful it might be. Wanda's went on to say, continue to seek the most complete explanation possible for what happened. So as you also, we are all here, how do you even begin the process of not merely rebuilding Rwanda, but reinventing a unified peace-loving nation out of this? Social reconstruction and recovery entailed strong imagining, imagination, redressing evil, evil, remembering. And remembering is never easy, but forgetting offers false sense, uh, false comfort and it brings even a greater risk. And we, we can go back to the even uh, genocide revisionism and, and uh, denial that Ndahiro alluded to that we are going to be talking about. By considering tragedy, by consigning tragedy into the dustbin, we fail to grapple with its meaning. We set the stage for the emergence. And in memory is understanding. By reflecting on the tragic events of 1994, by examining those factors that propelled such horrific violence, by engaging in a dialogue and a debate, individually and collectively we build bridges to healing. We forge a new path forward. And I'm so happy because I, I know uh, last week, our permanent representative, uh, uh, High Commissioner in London, uh, Ambassador Abusinje, was able to talk about Gachacha. He had the lecture on Ugachacha. So it's, it's good because you understand the importance of the memory as the justice as well. Through the community-based Gachacha courts, more than 2 million genocide-related cases were heard with around 60% resulting in a guilty verdict. Many of those uh, people who were convicted served the minimum or no prison time. It was a delicate exercise fraught with risk and without a single precedent. How could we deliver justice for millions of victims? Without mass incarceration, that would harm our economic prospect as well as create a society permanently divided between victims and perpetrators. Gachacha rose from the recognition that the genocide in Rwanda was unique 
and uniquely horrifying in nature. It pits neighbor against neighbor, as the task of killing Tutsi was delegated to whomever was willing to wield a machete or man a checkpoint. These were acts of intimate violence. In many cases, the killer knew the victim. In some instances, they were friends and family. We could not erase these crimes from our history without offending the memories of those we lost and those who survived. But nor could we become consumed with recriminations. Gachacha, our court system, let, let us just do that. Restorative justice, that is. Genocide against the Tutsi shook us to the core. We are haunted by the memory, but also determined to tame and mitigate the venom of that memory. This memory inhabits us and pervades our soul like what you heard from uh, Simon and then what Ndahiro is able to say. It will continue to affect and to cross lives for several generations. I'm not a survivor like Simon who carries with him the memory of those horrible days when his family was massacred for indeed, I was not in Rwanda in 1994. But by the same token, I'm a survivor for the same reason. If I lived in Rwanda at the same time, I would probably would have incurred similar fate of my parents, brothers and sisters by perishing in Mayaga. Similarly, my son, my son and the hero was born in Sacramento far from Rwanda, but he was robbed of an important link to his heritage when he lost his paternal and maternal grandparents and most of his extended family. He's like many in his situation, a repository of memory by proxy. The memory is transgenerational and it's our duty and responsibility to keep it alive. So I, for my last uh, brief stuff, I have to say the important thing is not only a common, you know, what we call a common memory, but a collective future through the construction of another possible history. Rwanda transformed the genocide wounded the memory into a resource for establishing a new contract of confidence and solidarity between Rwandans. What should be a major handicap has been transformed into a momentum for transformation into something higher and better. It provided an impetus for reinventing the nation citizenship and the donation state on the basis of a new agreement among all its people. 29 years ago, the task of a meaningful reconciliation seemed unfathomable for Rwanda, later on the challenge of rebuilding broken institution, reviving a dead economy and restoring uh, a semblance of hope among the spring and fearful population. Under our leadership of His Excellency President Paul Kagame, we have managed to exceed the expectations due to the tireless determination of the people of Rwanda who refused to accept that the genocide will be the final word. We refuse to give up on each other. We refuse to give up on our country. Rwandans share one language, one culture, same values and norms with a long history of peaceful and harmonious coexistence. We have turned our nation around because we are driven by sound principles of unity, accountability, and desire to take our nation to greater heights. And as a result, we found within ourselves the resilience and courage to reject the politics of division and hate. We chose a path that put emphasis on our common identity as Rwandans, and we dedicated ourselves to reconciliation. We rebuilt our institution from the ground up, implementing community-based justice that we mentioned, and initiating a range of homegrown solutions to address socioeconomic challenges at the grassroots. Our growth was always people-driven and people-centered. Reforms like this made it possible for 3.5 million refugees to come back home since the genocide. Reforms like this allowed uh, more than 1 million people to lift ourselves of poverty. More than 
reforms like this also made it possible for gender equality with 61% female representation in the parliament and 50 in cabinet. Reforms like this transformed diseases such as HIV, once death sentence, into a manageable chronic disease and mother to child transmission almost eradicated. Thanks to this and other advancement, including near universal health care life expectancy, has risen by 20 years over the past two decades. These milestones, uh, I have to tell you, are not just statistics designed to impress. Rather, they are the tangible outcome of hard work and a unified sense of purpose among Rwanda's leadership and its citizenship as citizens. It has been 29 years, more than a quarter of a century, and we have, we have really a, a long way to go. We still face many complex challenges that today and future generations will be called upon to address in order to continue building a unified and prosperous nation. Today, Rwanda is a, a new nation nurtured by the hard work of our leadership and resilience of our people. And we, the people of Rwanda, are committed also to continue to safeguard what we have accomplished as a unified nation. As uh, the last remarks uh, our president said, we cannot turn the clock back, nor can we undo the harm caused, but we have the power to determine the future and to ensure that what happened never happens again in Rwanda and wherever you can make a difference. And his message strongly resonates today for all of us. I call on all of you here, all the students who are in the, the room, all the new generation coming to stand together for our humanity. Genocide is a crime against humanity and to victimize everyone. Let's continue to build a strong bond of human uh, solidarity and let's strive to make never again a reality. I thank you so much and we really welcome your questions and reflections. Thank you so much, Matilde, Dahiro, and Simon for uh, always a stimulating and very moving presentation. And I think uh, we're right in suggesting that uh, we return at first with questions regarding what Dahiro had to say about denial and the threat of denial, not only in Rwanda, certainly very importantly there, but so many of our speakers this semester and in past have spoken of the growth and the rise of more waves of denial. And we hear constantly of more insidious acts of anti-Semitism over the past several years. I don't ask for a, an explanation of what has caused this, but do you think that denial has taken off that as time goes on and the distance between 1994 and today grows longer, uh, those who claim denial feel more emboldened. They feel not as many people remember that now is our chance to put it to rest, to bury it in the sands of history. What, what do you think of that? And we ask anyone in the audience, please contribute to this unique opportunity to ask questions of this distinguished panel. So please. Uh, maybe I can start and then I just be brief and uh, Gahiro and Simon can reflect on it. But uh, especially for, he mentioned, Gahiro alluded to the fact of the, the growth of the social media and how, you know, and also the whole globalization in general. You know, denial has become almost like uh, an acceptable thing, it's the, the discourse out there on the social media platform. And it's with impunity, no one is saying no uh, for, and uh, especially for people who pay attention, we even tried with uh, some of the social media platform like uh, Facebook or, or Twitter or many other things to mention the fact that denial is being uh, entertained on those media, but most of the time, people will, will invoke again freedom of speech and, and they will continue to, to say those stuff. But uh, so something that usually you wouldn't say in a polite society, now it's allowed and allowable out there. But uh, for Rwanda especially, 
I have to say that Dinaya started as soon as uh, genocide, just like uh, Dinaya is, even though it's the last stage, but it comes to our, even at the beginning. Uh, so when Dinaya was, it started at the time when people refused to call it what it was, genocide against the Tutsi and the whole international community that should have inter intervened because of the, uh, what was the covenants that were passed after the Holocaust of intervening when it's a genocide happening for one that was denied then at the beginning. So people were allowed to die, million people died because there was that denial. I have to tell you that you know, until recently, you know, I have to say it even in the United States to accept it, to use the proper, the proper terminology of what it is, it took a long time. Even in naming the, 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 what it is, is important in fighting against denial because there are people who hide behind playing around the words. You remember, and I applaud, applaud exactly again, uh, Sonoma State. You remember when we had the, the, the Memorial Grove. On the Memorial Grove, usually we, the people who had put to Gwanda genocide were able to, to talk to you and you were able to understand the importance of use, using proper terminology. So there are many different areas of denying what happened because people can hide behind the words. There are people who say Rwanda genocide. What is Rwanda genocide? It doesn't mean a lot. Who killed what? You know, in a genocide, there are victims and perpetrators. So um, so that's why there are many different areas where we had to fight against denying genocide. But the problem also being one of the latest genocide in our humanity, mm -hmm. it didn't end with 1994. It was stopped in Rwanda, but it was exported to other countries. Right now, in our region, there are people still calling on Tutsi to be killed. I didn't want to show today the horrible images of people who were cutting cows in that area because when you kill a cow during that time, it was Tutsi, and the entire Tutsi sentiment is still there in the Congo, for instance. Those are stuff that are on public, uh, in the public arena. It's not something I'm putting out here. So the people who left the country, even though genocide was stopped, the ideology didn't die with those people. And the people hiding in many foreign capitals also export the ideology that came with them. So we have that, and then now with the, 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 you know, the social media that Nahiro mentioned, now you can sit behind your computer and you can do all the damage you want against anybody, as long as you have many followers and then you have institutions buying into it. Some major universities, some major newspapers that peddle the same genocide ideology and denial. So we, we, we are fighting a, a protracted war, and I think it's every one of us who needs really to stand up and, and, and stand up and say what needs to be said when those things are happening. Whether it's a Holocaust denial, whether it's the Tutsi, you know, genocide against Tutsi, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Until you mentioned Congo specifically, do you think there's also a threat in Burundi and Uganda for anti Tutsi sentiment? To the, the Yatututsi sentiment was, was, was exported throughout the region. The good thing is that the more also the engagement with those countries, they start also to pay attention. But now, especially the Tutsis in the Congo are being killed because they are Tutsi. These are not even Rwandans. Some of them, because you remember the border and then the Berlin conference when it, you know, they are Congolese, but who are Tutsi by uh, heritage. So, and then most of the people who killed in Rwanda also found safe heaven in the Congo. So these people also carried with them the whole entire Tutsi sentiment, meaning that what started in Rwanda is still ongoing in some other parts of the world. Yeah. And of course, it, it also created that kind of vicious circle that uh, we're talking about. Dahira, you spoke specifically of Generation Z and that they sort of took off on this denial campaign against the genocide. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, um, I, and I wanna also say uh, my generation, the millennials as well, um, what I found, something that I observed and that I found very interesting in the bad way was um, 
was seeing how the denialism is transmitted to the next generation and who it's led by. Because um, if you look at the people who had originally been pushing the denialism and trying to say, actually, people were just killing each other. And when you see that they're younger people, many of the times um, those specific Rwandans, you know, they're Rwandans in the diaspora. Generally, they could be in Belgium, they could be in other parts of Europe. Um, many times they're trying to rehabil rehabilitate the, the images of their parents who were actually perpetrators. So, and that's that has been the case for many of the uh, Rwandan genocide denial. So you're seeing people around mine, Simon's age. These were people who grew up with the Inheta Hamwe ideology growing up and they see themselves as the victims. So, you know, maybe I'm not sure about their motives. If it's to rehabilitate, maybe they truly do believe they were the victims, but um, it's been more and more evident that uh, people in my generation, the millennials who are really starting to not just be more established in their careers, but also to switch their careers, many millennials and even some Gen Z are starting to gain prominence on the global stage as well. They're starting to attain power. They're starting to attain positions in certain areas to where now they're starting to get uh, more and more influence. You know, Simon, he's been working, uh, you know, in NBC, he's, he's getting his position there. And, you know, I've been working in the legal field for the last few years. And, and I see that people in our position as we attain power, you know, some people are really using it for certain, uh, certain reasons that, which, which is promoting genocide denial. So, um, and to me, I, I see it in this way because the genocide literally happened when I was a child. And so now that I'm an adult, I'm seeing, you know, these people who are around my age saying, oh, no, that actually didn't happen. And it's like, no, we I, I, I've seen how it how it went, you know, and I I've had people directly affected. But I'm having people younger than me tell me what happened, you know, in these certain ways. So actually, I, I believe that the greatest threats aren't even the genocidaires or the in Hamway or the original ones, I believe the greatest threats are people, you know, in the reverse position of me, people in my generation, people who are younger, who are starting to attain prominence, who are going into foreign diplomacy, who are going into politics, who are trying to start nonprofits, those types of things. So it's like now I'm 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 understanding that this is this this is like an eternal type of fight you know it's not something you just end at one level it pass it transmits itself and it passes down through the generation so that's that's specifically what i meant and and it's you can see it all over twitter i believe twitter is you know it it shows a lot of um uh, it shows a lot of what uh rwandans in general uh feel from the younger generation more of the younger generation on but um it's it's a very important vector in which that denialism is spread absolutely absolutely uh do you think it's becoming harder to sustain the truth do you think that the, as time goes on it's it's, it's it's fading that it's more or less subject to interpretation than it once was i believe that they're trying to make it so they're trying to make the truth harder to, you know, find out. And that's the reason why we need people like Simon. That's the reason why we need, you know, these lecture series. That's the reason why, um, you know, the most important inventions actually were, you know, the video, recording video and pictures so that you actually have evidence for these people who come in and say this stuff never happened, so. And I true. want to add one thing to, to Wanda here was saying, uh, you know, talks like this for sure makes a difference. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is, you know, when I first moved to, to Oregon, uh, there was another Rwandan here uh, in Bend, Oregon. And that's rare, you know, to see two Rwandans in one, one small town. Uh, and this kid, uh, you know, his dad was killed in the genocide when he 
So he went to a Tutsi home. He went to commit genocide and, you know, they were ready for him. So that, you know, they ended up killing him. Uh, so long story short, you know, this kid and his mom ended up here in, in the United States uh, and he was playing, you know, he was on a basketball team doing well, but his mom, you know, made a mission that every time this kid got interviewed, he would tell the media that the genocide never happened. The Tutsis were actually the one killing the Hutus. So it's like it was reversed. All right. So, you know, I ended up meeting with him and, you know, met his girlfriend, you know, nice lady. Uh, and she told me and actually showed me all the newspaper articles that he's been in you know, saying that the genocide, you know, never happened. Uh, and then she continued to learning more. And she saw one of the videos from, you know, actually from Sonoma State back in the days. Uh, you know, she educated herself. And, and eventually, you know, she called it off, you know, with the guy, because she learned is that everything that I've learned from you so far, you know, it's been false. You know, he has it. And that's not what happened. Um, so yeah, you know, again, you know, talks like this for sure, you know, makes a difference and people will see the truth eventually, you know, again, deniers can go out and say whatever they want to say, uh, but, you know, the truth always comes up and it's up to us to continue, you know, speaking the truth. That's certainly true. And I hope we have more opportunity to do exactly that. Uh, I know you, you know, a lot of people go to Rwanda because of its beautiful landscape. It's a fascinating country. Do you have uh, something like a genocide tourism where people are come in and are shown this truth and are shown what is left of that horror? I think you're, you're mute. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, most people go and, uh, and uh, see our memorial centers. We have quite a few. We have one in Kigali that is the biggest uh, and uh, throughout the country. Uh, we, is, uh, as I was telling you, uh, even if churches, we have many churches that are monuments, uh, you know, where we have the, the memorial of Tens of thousands of people, not you know, like uh, ten thousand people who are buried in one church and so on and so forth throughout the country. So we have many many memorial centers, and one in Kigali. Usually, most people who visit the country that's the first place they they begin with, and I think uh, it, it's a place uh, of learning. You know, it's to understand also. I think whatever we have said it can make you understand the character of this country. Uh, the suffering, but also the, the resilience, you know, how can you come from here to there? Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a, I think it's a place of learning. Uh, and I think anyone who has been in those memorials and come back and be denied, it's because they will never believe anything. So I, mm -hmm. I, I believe, and I hope that, I have to say that there are quite a few people from Sonoma who have been to Rwanda, including some students, who were at the Holocaust and the genocide series, teaching series, they went there, two of them. But also since then, we've, we've had many uh, people who went, including Christine, the Vidian who went to Rwanda also. So there are a number of people who have been. So I hope that at one point or another, especially for students and other people interested in, uh, in visiting the country, that will be a place to go and to see also the mechanism of teaching, uh, what we are trying to do to make uh, that we, we try to fight against the genocide. You know, uh, all, all this dialogue we are talking about has uh, permeated all our institutions in how we are doing it. Very good. A member of our audience asks, what do you see as being the roots of the hatred? Not that there is an excuse, but where did it come from? It's, I, I can say quickly, uh, one of the things is, is really the, the deep changes that came to our society brought by colonialism. So colonialism, uh, if I don't, because it can take a long time to just talk about all the roots that led to genocide, but uh, one is that when colonial powers came to Africa in general, 
they really thrived or divide and conquer because that was the only way they could really lead with countries that they didn't know anything about. Our, our country was in the same uh, predicament. Initially, it was colonized by uh, Germany, but because Germany uh, was not there for a long time, uh, after World War I, they lost colonies and they were under the Belgian authority. And the Belgians established that system of division within the population where they assign even you know, uh, identity based on uh, physical characteristics or, or uh, ethnicity that were pretty fluid in the past, but they became very stuck. So for all of us, eventually we were given those identity cards. And uh, you know, like many countries in Africa, we had many groups that had uh, met in one country, formed a unified nation, didn't have any civil war in our society prior to colonialism. This is a fact of history. There was no such a thing. There was a social mobility, people could freely intermarry. But after, during, so during colonialism, we were divided into groups, stark groups, highly polarized. And what happened was that we were given identity cards that became also like uh, weapons of, of killing. If we had uh, an identity card as a tutsi, we were killed. But the genocide itself was prepared over, over several decades. So at the end of colonialism, the Hutu majority were pro prepared by the Belgians to take the power. And really the, the Belgians were still in charge in the first government. So it was the, also the, they gave, uh, how would I say it? The, the, the license to kill the Tutsi and to chase them out of the country. From the beginning, since 1959, 1962, most of them left. Uh, 1968, 1973. So it was really, it was not one time only. The genocide in 1994 had been a continuous journey for the Tutsis who were ostracized in their own country. They became foreigners within throughout all those administrations. That's why when genocide happened, I was not in my country, we were refugees. So the ones who were in the country were killed, they took the opportunity to finish off the two things. Mm -hmm. So anyone who survived in Rwanda during that time, like Simon, it was a miracle. It was like the last, and the, the same words that were used during the, the Holocaust, like a final solution were used in Rwanda as well. We had the 10 commandments on how to kill the two things. All those stuff were, in place, but it has been that enmity has been growing, and it was pro, it was uh, promoted by the Belgians to be able to uh, maintain their power in the country until one group decided to kill the other group and uh, to do that. But as I said, because in the past people had intermarried, that's why it became so uh, why the institutions failed. All of them, including families, there were people who had intermarried and who killed the other side of the family because they belong to the two things. So as you can see, um, it was um, it, all the, the you, you've learned about uh, Gregory Stanton, all the stages and how it came about, all those stuff, you can list them in, uh, as we were reading to the Tutsi genocide in Rwanda. Another student asks, what do you feel are the best ways to fight genocide ideology, especially as this ideology continues to seep through the DRC border and violence is perpetrated against Tutsi? Let me tell you, um, the thing is, sometimes we give too much credit to our governments and we let politics drive all the thing uh, because the world can stand by. The UN sees what is happening because the UN in the region, just like it was in Rwanda. But I think people can make a huge difference. Uh, individuals can make a difference. Like even a forum like this, it's, most of the time we see those articles that are denying, that are, uh, or, or even promoting this killing or no one caring. You know, sometimes you've heard, for instance, what is happening in Ukraine. You've mm. seen how covered this has been. And I'm not complaining because this should be covered, but look at how many people cover what is happening in the region. And yet it's happening. People die on a daily basis. 
and it's on record. You know, New York Times will carry on that. Uh, you know, YouTube's are there. You know, calling on people to kill those two things. It's everywhere. Even politicians parade those, those feelings in front. What I can say, because we can't really change the world, uh, we, we are also in this geopolitical quagmire. I don't really know how to deal with it. We are all trying to deal with it any way we can in our own capacity and so on. But it's when people stand up and speak up and put up, uh, when I think about the human uh, civil rights movement, it was the students, the young people who were always in the forefront to denounce and to say things. You know, uh, someone was saying, and I think you probably know who, but the worst is not violence, the worst is apathy. You know, when people just, who, who is going to speak out for these people? It comes, uh, the victim is cry, but when no one stands up and says this is not a, a right thing, and then most of the time in institution, I've seen it where, I, where we are right now, in the East Coast, because we also interact more often. But people will come and deny genocide in the institution, and they actually highlight those people. You know, there are stuff where, and sometimes you'll find a few Rwandans or a few people in the Holocaust and genocide studies who are going to protest. But other people just sit and let them come and parade their feelings of hatred and stuff like that, and we let it pass. Institutions have a lot to do, uh, whatever institutions you are in, especially in academia, because ideas yes. pass. You know, we, we can do whatever we can. We can write to our Congress people who are playing key roles in those areas. We can. And it's, or even a phone call. These people really it makes a huge difference. I've seen, for instance, when you call your Congress person and say, you know what? We hear that there are two being killed and get all the information. It's out there and you can give it, even if people can. And then a call, just put a call there. We say, we know you are on foreign affairs committee. You are on African committee. Why are you allowing? people to be killed. That alone can make a big difference because these are elected by it. So they, they respect the voices of people who are coming from their, uh, their constituency. So there are a number of things I think people can do, even writing individually. I think that as long, if you, all of us put our own small brick, you know, a house is, is built by many small bricks together, but it comes. Matilda Hero Simon, I thank you again. Uh, this is my last episode of the Holocaust Lecture Series. I'll be retiring at the end of the week. And oh, no. I'm very glad to have spent it with you. I remember your lectures from 10 years ago. And of course, it's been a steady progression. You have always been an inspiration. And we are very, very lucky to have had you. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn you over now to the Alliance. I know that they will want to talk to you as well. And Christine will be coming on shortly. I'm... Oh, Diane, before you go, let me thank you so much. We have been one of the best. And I hope that you will take time to go to Rwanda and we can. Uh, it's on my agenda. Uh, put it on your it's agenda. On your agenda. <laughs> Congratulations on the retirement, Diane. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm thank looking you so forward much. to it. <laughs> Where did, uh, is Christine here? Not yet. Oh, oh, uh, here I am, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Hi, um, Christine. So, hi, how is everybody? Um, I just want um, to, to quick announcement to peep, the people who are on uh, as guests. Um, if you are a guest um, from the uh, Rwandan Embassy or you're related to one of our speakers, please stay on the line. You can join the Alliance Board afterwards. Um, to speak to all of our speakers. Otherwise, um, if you can just drop off uh, the Zoom, we would really appreciate that. So I'm gonna start moving people on over. And um, Matilde, Hero, Simon, if you know who's on, let me know. I know I'm looking for, here's Catherine right